I'm Greg Prince and welcome to Gospel Tangents. Shim describes Mark's physical condition in jail. It's pretty interesting to hear both his bomb injuries as well as his injuries from jail. Check out that conversation. But before you do that, I also wanted to remind you to check out our Facebook page. Go to facebook.com slash gospel tangents where you can join in the conversation. You can ask questions of the interviewers and also you can tell me who you'd like to interview next. Also like our page there. That'll really help us get more visitors. Facebook.com slash gospel tangents. Now back to our conversation. I noticed that you, you did show me, and I didn't read it cl- as closely as I, I wanted to, but because in his, I don't know if you'd call that a confession or, or that document where he uh, wrote, yeah, they to, wrote the to the parole board. Parole board. Exactly. Um, I do remember it said that he wasn't even sure why he, why he had killed some of these people. I would take that with some skepticism. <laughs> I would take that with some skepticism because this is now a full year after being in prison and he is trying to present a picture to the parole board that he may get out someday. So I would be very suspect with anything that he says in there. It may be true. That's not to say that it is all necessarily lies. I hear that all the time. Well, you can't believe anything he says because he lies all the time. That's not true. He always lies when it's convenient and when it when it helps. But so there are a way to find out if he says a thing, if it's true, because if you can confirm it outside of him, then you could know that it was true. But anything like that, did did he really not know who he was gonna kill? Mm, maybe. Maybe I, I I'm gonna maybe because that's that's looking back and because as it turns out, he's actually should have been out of prison a long time ago. For what he was actually pled guilty to, there's a federal sentencing guideline matrix. It's actually a little chart uh, you can uh, you can probably find it online, but it kind of puts on there what the crime is, prior conviction, stuff like that, and it comes up with a nine and a half years. And the idea is is that sentencing guidelines can be pretty uniform throughout the United States. He his matrix, he would have been out in nine and a half years. Well, he's not out. And I don't think he ever will. It's been 20 years now, right, since he went to jail? Well, it was 1987. Seven. January of 1987. So, yeah, it's, no, 30 years. 30 years, 30 yeah, years. 30 years. 30 yeah, 30 years. years. So, you'd think I would do better with math. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then I can just follow up a little bit of that, because I talked about his mandatory review, and we talked, you know, his confession and all that. Um, they were so put off with him that when they, you know, they took all the information and then they deliberated and then they came back. I don't know if it's the same day or something, but they said, you know, like I say, normally they'll say come back in a certain amount of time. They said, don't ever come back. Don't even waste the pencil lead. Don't ever come back. Now, I had occasion some years later several years later, to talk to the guy, to a guy who at the time was the head of the parole board. Uh, I was at a conference and he was there and, I, and it turned out I could kind of take him aside and ask him a question. And I said, would you mind if I ask you a question about one of the prisoners? And he immediately said, oh, don't ask me because there's so many out there and I can't keep track of them all. And I said, I think you may remember this one. And so I told him, Mark Hoffman, oh, he knew that one. Yeah, he could remember that one. I said, is he ever going to get out? He said, as far as I understand, no. And he said, I'll tell you why. He said, the parole board turns over frequently. It's a very awful position, so people don't stay long periods of time. And so since it's such high turnover, there's no way for any group that's in at a particular time to know all the particulars of a case, especially as it gets older and older. As a result, he said we rely heavily upon what was said and done at the time with the belief that they are very familiar with the particulars and the, you know, the nuances of it. And, and so then we just rely on them because we believe they know it much better than we do. So it's very difficult for us. It would take an extraordinary circumstance for us to countermand something that they did. And he said, and I have seen his, and he said, I, as far, I can tell you as far as I'm concerned, all the time I'm here, never. He will die out here. Should? I think, I think so. Should. He, he's, a, he's of no value. 
that the world does not need him. He can, even if he could contribute something, you know. I know there's some people who are kind of bleeding hearts. Oh, he could become a contributing man. We don't need him. He needs to spend the rest of his life in jail. He needs to go out there. And however it happens, and I actually, no, I, I have no ill will toward him. I mean, I don't, I don't want to go throw rocks at him or, or try to hurt him or something. But he needs to stay there. And actually, a lot of people, again, get confused, I think, because they think, oh, he got off easy. He got off bad. Because he went in at 30 or 32, which means that logically he will spend 50 or 60 years. And prison's not a good place. People say, oh, it's a country club. It's not a country club. So he gets to think about what he did for the rest of his life. And it's bad enough out there that he tried to commit suicide at least once and almost succeeded. Do you remember the details around that? Sure. Um, he was out in maximum security. That was as, as a punitive measure. And he had uh, collected sleeping pills from other inmates. They have a whole network of stuff that passes around in there. And so he collected uh, sleeping pills. And he took everything that he had. But it was insufficient to kill him because he took those and then went all night and then he was you know all, i mean he was in very poor shape but then as the guards came around someone noticed you know that he hadn't moved and so they went in and so then he was rushed over the infirmary and his stomach was pumped or whatever i don't know but then he was saved so had he had more pills or been able to go longer he may have succeeded but it did damage him physically quite badly because the way he had laid, he had laid on top of, and I can't remember which arm it is. Physically, he is not in great shape these days because from the bombing, he had a severe injury to one of his knees. He's missing kind of part of the fingers on one hand where he flipped that thing over. There was a lot of damage to one of the arms, and then, you know, he has some scars around. And then from laying there, he had laid on his arm, and you know what it's like when you you know, when your arm goes to sleep or your hand goes to sleep and it hurts and you wake up, you know, uh, it hurts real bad. Well, of course, he never woke up. And so it, it wrecked the, the, the tissue on one of his hands and arms quite badly. And so when you see him, one arm is, there's scars, but one arm's all real skinny because he lost quite a bit of the flesh off that, off that hand as a result. I know in the book, Salamander, one of the policemen, or detectives, I'm not sure which, said that the uh, hand that did the forging has been permanently damaged. <laughs> that may be. Yeah. That may be. That's a curiosity. I wonder if it would make any difference. I don't know. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Shannon Flynn. I'm actually going to let Shannon introduce our next conversation in question. People have asked me, well, do you think you would ever murder anybody again? And I believe yes and no. Click here to subscribe. Click here for a transcript. And over here, you'll see some other videos that we've done here on YouTube. We hope you'll use this as a valuable resource to learn more about Mormon history.